We humans have been on the earth for more than a million years. But civilization, life in cities, has come about only in the last 5,000. Through history, civilizations rose and fell. Carved out of nature, dependent on nature, in the end, nature took them back. But in the past few hundred years, one form of civilization, that of the West, has changed the balance with nature forever. And now, it is civilization itself which has become the central problem of our planet. To understand why, we must look afresh at how we see history. In our time, at the end of the 20th century, many people in the West speak as if the future course of history has been settled. People talk of the triumph of the West, of the victory of liberal democracy and the free market, and even of the end of history. The questions which have concerned humanity for so long. What is society for? How should it be organized? What are human rights and freedoms? And how do they relate to nature and to the spiritual? These questions about the goals of life, it is said, have now been settled in favor of the values of the West. But there have been, and there still are, civilizations which have seen the world very differently. Civilization arose independently in a handful of places on the face of the earth. In Iraq, Egypt, India, China, and here in the jungles of the Americas. And the oldest and greatest of those, India and China, are still alive in the land of their birth. And each of those civilizations created a unique and distinctive vision of life, which forms a vital counterpoint to that of the West. This series of journeys is a search, a search for those first civilizations and their continuing legacy. It's through such images that the West has come to know Iraq. To most of us, its history and culture were a blank before 1991. Yet by terrible irony, when the Western powers came to make war here in Iraq, they were returning to the very source of their own civilization. This journey was made on the eve of the Gulf War. It's a journey through Iraq and through Iraqi history back to the origins of the first civilization. Searching in the present for clues to the past, and in the past for clues to the present, Civilization means life in cities. It means large populations with great ceremonial buildings. It means writing. And all these things are found for the first time on Earth, here in this ferocious landscape of South Iraq, Old Sumer. Here was the first law, the first science, the first war. And now, what remains is a stark warning to our pride in the human achievement. For this is all that's left of the world's first cities. Civilization was born on the banks of two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Mesopotamia, as the Greeks called it, the land between the two rivers, had few other natural resources. No stone, no wood or precious metals, only water and a rich alluvial soil with which a hard-working people could transform a land of scarcity into a land of plenty. And 
The other great resource of Iraq was its people. Iraqis are a mixture of Arabs, Kurds, Turks, Persians, whose ancestry goes back to the mysterious people who created the first civilization, the Sumerians. Their character today is still the same as in their ancient proverbs, long-suffering, resilient, hard-bitten, pessimistic. Heirs to a brilliant but terrible history, repeatedly conquered by their neighbors, or brutalized by rapacious military regimes, whose conception of justice was an iron fist in the land where law was first devised. Not surprisingly, they were a people who pondered deeply the meaning of life. Iraq is matched only by India as a cradle of religions, rich alternative traditions which have all ended up living side by side. The history of Iraq then is rich in splendors and sorrows, the most gifted of civilizations and yet the most tragic, the first attempt by humankind to bring people together in organized societies with a measure of happiness. Another key quality of civilization is continuity or rootedness. The old towns of Iraq are the oldest continuously inhabited on earth. And it was to places like this, Tel Afa, in the 19th century, that Western explorers came for the first time looking for origins in the land which the Bible said was the cradle of the human race. Here at Tel Afa, at the dawn of Mesopotamian archaeology, in 1846, the English excavator Austin Layard, famous for his discoveries at the cities of Nineveh and Nimrud, climbed up here to the top of the citadel one evening. And as the sun set, he says, I looked out and counted over a hundred mounds out there throwing their long and darkening shadows across the plain. Each of those mounds had built up over millennia with the accumulated debris of human settlements. The one on which this citadel is built has more than 50 feet of debris extending back 6,000 years. Perhaps nowhere, as here in Iraq, is there such a continuity. And some of those cities, out there in the plain to the south, were among the most famous in the history of the world. Ur of the Chaldees, Nineveh, Babylon. Source of some of the greatest tales in our culture. The creation, the flood, the Garden of Eden, the Tower of Babel. Those stories all come from the magical landscape of Iraq's deep south. Here on the edge of the great alluvial plain of Sumer is a wild and beautiful marshland where the Tigris and Euphrates meet. This was the biblical Garden of Eden. Up to the very eve of the Gulf War, it was still possible to enter this world and see a way of life preserved for thousands of years since long before civilization, the Marsh Arabs. The Marsh Arab villages look much as the first settlements must have done. Man-made islands in freshwater lagoons where they still live by fishing, raising water buffalo, cutting the reed beds and cultivating the rich soil along the shores and levees. Their reed houses, some nearly a hundred feet long, are still built in the same fashion as was depicted 5,000 years ago in the art of Sumer. In this world of almost limitless potential, the book of Genesis says the first cities arose in the beginning when God let dry land rise from the water. And in the beginning, said the Sumerian myths, was Eridu. Legend said this was the mound of creation, the first land which arose from the primal sea at the beginning of time. Here was a sacred shrine which preceded the first cities. At the root of civilization, 
is the temple. Eridu is lonely, windswept and abandoned today. But it was one of the most famous places in the history of Mesopotamia. Not only did the Sumerians believe that this was the site of the mound of creation, they thought that here kingship, that is political society, first came down to earth and that here the arts of civilization were initially developed. It originally stood on a great sea of fresh water stretching out to the south, the Apsu. And the great temple here, the most famous shrine in Sumer, was named after it, Apsu. Named after that primeval ocean of sweet water out of which all human life and all natural life came. So they believed. And in fact, when the archaeologists dug deep into the temple hill, they discovered around the time of 5000 BC, a little sand mound surrounded by a reed fence with a tiny chapel on it, marking the site of that mound of creation. Hard as it may seem in this blasted landscape, but we're in the area of the original Garden of Eden. For what the Bible calls paradise, Eden, was simply the Sumerian word Edin, the wild grassland of the south, the natural landscape before the arrival of the city. And picking over the debris of paradise, it's hard not to see the psychological truth of the Bible story, that the very beginning of our ascent to civilization was also the fall, when we tasted the fateful fruit of the tree of knowledge, the means by which we would become masters of the earth and yet eventually gain the power to destroy it and ourselves. Truly a devil's bargain. Sumerian myths also tell how the arts of civilization which originated here in Eridu would bring both joy and sorrow. This, they believed, was what the gods passed on from here to future ages through the first true city on earth, Uruk. To get to Uruk today, you cross southern Iraq, skirting Ur and Nazaria, names familiar now after the war of 1991. Then you enter a lunar landscape, a wasteland swept by gales of sand. Immense mounds loom out of the haze in a furnace heat. It's 135 degrees out here in the summer. Finally, you come to a city gate, still visible after nearly 5,000 years. Its approach silted with a deep tide of pottery and bones. What feelings of anticipation any city dweller of our planet in the late 20th century would experience, arriving at the place which more than any other has shaped our modern world, both in its triumphs and in its disasters. The first Westerner to stand here in modern times, the Englishman William Loftus in 1849, was simply astounded. Of all the desolate sights I ever beheld, he said, that of a rook incomparably surpasses all. Still 50 feet high, the line of eroded walls curves round to the horizon. In the centre of the city are the ruins of a great stepped tower, a ziggurat, on which had stood the temple of the city's goddess, Inanna, whom we know as Ishtar. The first city began as a religious centre. Standing on top of the goddess's ziggurat here in Uruk, you can get a real idea of the vast extent of this site with a circuit of walls of more than six miles. 
Archaeology can show that these walls were built at the end of a period of extraordinary expansion when Uruk increased four times in size in just a few generations. Presumably then, thousands or even tens of thousands of people were moving in from the countryside to this new city life. And there are parallels for this kind of change from rural to urban life in Europe, for example, in England during the Industrial Revolution. Scholars now believe that the population of the Euphrates Plain may have increased tenfold in these crucial 200 years. And to parallel that, you'd have to look at Mexico City today, doubling its size in 20 or 30 years. The effect of such growth was shattering. As far as the eye can see, this salt-encrusted plain was once big wheat country, with grain yields as high as the Midwest and Canada. But the need for more land, more intensive cultivation to feed an ever-growing population, eventually devastated the landscape. We know now that civilization inevitably destroys the environment, but they discovered it here for the first time. The question was the same for them, as it is for us today. How to balance the fertility of the earth against the voracious demands of the city. The watchman at Uruk, Muha Abu Guma, lives out here with his family. He belongs to one of the Montefic tribes who inhabit this part of the desert. His forefathers fought the Turks, the British, indeed anyone who tried to impose their rule on the south from the outside. Now what is this though? White temple, yeah, yeah. And this is Sumeria now? From, from Sumer, yeah. He knows the site like the back of his hand, down to the deep levels, these massive foundations of old Sumer. A stone-built storeroom from 3000 BC for temple food and beer. Alcohol is a Mesopotamian word. This is amazing, isn't it? So, after, after, um, party and... Society. With the ups and downs of any living organism, the city lasted through to about 300 AD. But by the Arab conquest, it was dead after a life of over 5,000 years. It's a salutary experience walking these weathered gullies, littered with testimony to the long ascent of man, if such it is. Here were enormous temples and palaces as big as cathedrals, their facades decorated with blue glazed tiles, just as you'll see today on the mosques of Iraq. This is from the Irigal Palace. So this is, so this is from the front of the wall of the palace. And from the Seleucid times. So this is when the palace was rebuilt in after the time of Alexander the Great. 2000. More than 2000 years old, isn't that astonishing? Thank you very much. This is Obeid. So this is Obeid. No, Obey. So it's 6,000 years? 6,000. <laughs> and this? But what is this here? What, what is this, Mr. Moha? Umla Bartie. It's uh, money, it's uh, a coin. Money, flus. Of, of the Parthians. Uh, Bartie. So this is, this is from a rook in the time of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Right. And this, I think I recognize. And from the deep past, hints of the enigmatic beginnings we saw at Eridu. Sumerian pottery, wheel-turned pottery, for the wheel is found here for the first time in history, along with so many other great inventions we still live our lives by today. Here was the first astronomy, the first literature, the first school, the first map of the world. Here they first thought of dividing time and space in multiples of 60, so that even now, whenever we look at a watch, we're still in their debt. Inside Muha's guest hut, within the old walls, were the only inhabitants of Ishtar's city tonight. It's wonderful to be here. And all these, these are your, are your children, your little children. Hello. Even so, Muha still observes the gracious formalities of desert hospitality. Thank you so much for showing me around Warka. It's this wonderful sight.
Iraqis have always been great storytellers. Going back through the thousand and one nights to the world's first literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh built the walls. Yeah. Gilgamesh built the walls. King of Uruk, first and best of heroes. His was the original tale of the flood and the great ark, known today to almost every child across the world. His last adventure was the futile quest for everlasting life, model for all searches from the Odyssey to the Holy Grail, Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And we know his story because of writing. Writing is first found in the world here in Uruk, may be invented in this city by some unknown genius not long before 3000 BC. Without writing, there could be no civilization. And it was through writing that we humans found a kind of immortality, passing on our memory to posterity, so that even now we can go back with them, as they would say, to a far-off day, on a far-off night, in a far-off time, in a rook, as the scribe writes, Gilgamesh, what you seek you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his lot, eternal life they withheld. Let your every day be full of joy, love the child that holds your hand, let your wife delight in your embrace, for these alone are the concerns of humanity. This is Irbil, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. It's one of several mud-brick towns in the north of Iraq, which have survived from the age of the first cities right up to our own time. Its great gate has been entered by conquerors from Alexander the Great and Tamburlaine to guerrilla armies in the recent wars in Kurdistan. Its mud-brick walls and houses fallen and rebuilt so many times over the years that the city now rests on a mound a hundred feet deep in debris. Here, at the end of the second millennium AD, is the very image of the first urban life on Earth. Massive burned brick walls towering over the plain. If you could have flown over the densely packed workers' quarters of Uruk, Nippur, or Ur of the Chaldees, this is what you would have seen. And within the walls of Irbil, we can still get an idea of how people lived and how society was organized in those first cities of old Sumer. For here, the past literally is still alive. Inside the old citadel at Irbil, you find yourself in a maze of narrow lanes and alleyways fanning out from the main gate. And although the mud brick houses on either side have been rebuilt and destroyed countless times over the generations, the pattern of the streets is still essentially the same. There are 800 families here today, that's 4,000 people, organized into neighborhood wards just as they were in Ur and Nippur. So these were small-scale, face-to-face communities which knew each other or were related by kinship or marriage or from the old village, perhaps with a, a local shrine and a tiny little market, rather like later Islamic cities where each ward had its mosque, its souk and its bath. In ancient times, the soul of the Mesopotamian town was the temple, towering over the mud-brick streets, a visible assurance to the townspeople that God was among them. It's still like that today. The al Mullah family has run the mosque here in Irbil for 600 years, in just the same fashion in ancient cities like Uruk or Nippur. Single families can be traced over many generations running the main temples. In this little corner of Iraq, the gods have come and gone. Ishtar, Zoroaster, Yahweh, Jesus, and now Allah. But the ritual of worship itself has remained. And on this spot where the oracle of the goddess Ishtar once stood, 
there's been continuous worship for longer than anywhere else in the world. In such continuity, perhaps, lies one of the defining qualities of civilization. Civilization was a great achievement, and the Sumerians were justly proud of it. They loved city life and the luxuries it afforded. But at heart they were a pessimistic people who knew how fragile human achievement could be. On the famous standard from the golden age of the city of Ur, images of war and peace are mysteriously juxtaposed. One of the great Sumerian myths tells how the goddess Inanna brought the arts of civilization from the god of wisdom, Enki of Eridu, like Pandora's box. Here were the delights of society, exquisite craftsmanship, beautiful clothes, the arts of sex and music. But civilization has a darker side, said Enki, which has to be accepted along with the good. There was the art of being mighty, the art of being kind, the art of straightforwardness, the art of deceit, the art of kingship, justice, and the enduring crown. The resounding note of a musical instrument, rejoicing of the heart, the kindling of strife, the plundering of cities, the setting up of lamentation, fear, pity, terror. All this is civilization, said the God of wisdom. All this I give you, and you must take it all with no argument, and once taken, you cannot give it back. In around 2000 BC, signs of foreboding swept Sumer. Too much agricultural land had been ruined. Inflation set in, famine, economic collapse. Evil, wrote the king Ibisin, is descending on our land. Then, all the cities of Sumer were smashed by a coalition of ancient enemies from Iran and the desert. Ur is destroyed. Bitter is its lament. The country's blood now fills its holes like hot bronze in a mold. Bodies dissolve like fat in the sun. Our temple is destroyed. The gods have abandoned us like migrating birds. Smoke lies on our city like a shroud. Their lament has echoed down the ages, to be heard again at Troy, at Dresden, at Hiroshima. And how loaded with meaning it is for we of the late 20th century. For now we too have seen the columns of smoke hanging over Mesopotamia like a shroud. The people of Sumer would sing laments for their sacked cities for 2,000 years. Meanwhile, refugees fled Iraq on the caravan routes across the western desert, images evoking those of our own time. City dwellers become as one with nomads who'd never known a city. Among them, the Bible says, was a citizen of Ur, now revered by half the world, Abraham. Witnesses to the ruin of civilization. 
faced by the unyielding harshness of nature. Cast out of Eden, for such people perhaps the old gods had failed. For Abraham, son of an idol maker in the old city of Ur, the disaster sowed the seeds of an idea which would change the world. An idea of stark simplicity, a single God, God the Father. <laughs> Abraham took his idea with him as he migrated to Palestine. And now, ironically, he's viewed as the founding father by Jews, Christians and Muslims alike. For Abraham was the first man to make a covenant with God. It was perhaps Iraq's greatest legacy to the world. In the 7th century AD, Arab armies bearing the new faith of Islam swept into Mesopotamia, here at the cliff which gave the land its name, Al-Iraq. The coming of Islam to the land of Abraham was in a sense a homecoming, culmination of a long trend in the spiritual life of the Near East. Babylonians, Assyrians, Greeks and Persians had all ruled this intractable brown land in long cycles of growth and decay. And gradually, through the triumphs and disasters, the people had come to view God with an attitude of unquestioning submission. And so the way was paved for the coming of Islam to the cliff which gave the land its name, Al-Iraq. After the Arab conquest in the south of Iraq, Old Sumer, Islam took on a distinctive local form which remained true to its ancient past, Shiism. In the sacred city of Kerbala, the Shiites carried the ancient Sumerian tradition of lamentation close to their hearts, as no other faith has done. And so it had been for thousands of years before Islam. Even the physical appearance of the great mosque of Imam Hussein at Kerbala recalls the buildings of old Sumer with its mosaics and the same blue tiles which had adorned the shrines of Uruk. true temple, as the Sumerians would have said, shining like a rainbow in the bright sun. Shiism remains today the religion of the farmers and peasants of southern Iraq, old Sumer, ruled since the Arab conquest by Sunni Muslim masters in Baghdad. In 1991, at the end of the Gulf War, Kerbala was devastated as the Shiites rose again against their overlords. Once more, the sacred shrine of Sumer was sacked and desecrated. And as so often before, the people of the south were left to lament. With such a tragic and turbulent history, it's amazing that so many different sects have managed to survive and flourish here. This is a Mandean wedding. The Mandeans are an astonishing survival of ancient Mesopotamian religious traditions. You could say they're the last of the Babylonians, but they also put us in touch with the baptismal customs out of which Christianity arose. For like Jesus, they call themselves followers of John the Baptist. Their wedding ceremonies are accompanied by full immersion in the Tigris, which in commemoration they still call the Jordan.
This is perhaps as near as we can get today to the culture in which Jesus lived. The Mandeans are a reminder of how pluralism and tolerance are essential qualities of civilization. A reminder too of how ordinary Iraqi people, despite the catastrophes of their history, have preserved tenaciously the things they hold dear. Life is victorious, says their marriage service. And indeed, what if a man gain the whole world and lose his soul? Baghdad had been founded by the Arab conquerors of Iraq in the 8th century. It became the greatest cultural center in the world, the richest city on earth, it was said. Little survives of that time today. Successive destructions of Baghdad have seen to that. But in the center of the old city is the mosque of its patron saint, Abd al-Gelani. This was built at a time when colleges and philanthropic institutions were created throughout Islam before the universities of the West before Oxford, the Sorbonne, and Bologna. The civilized atmosphere of its courtyards brings to mind the great scholars of the past who learned and taught here. Scholars who translated the sacred books of the Jews and Christians as they said that we might better understand the decisions of God. Humane learning, wrote one of them, Abd al-Latif, leaves an aura like a ray of bright light shining on those who come after. And inside the shrine, you're reminded again of the old customs of Mesopotamian worship in the glittering Holy of Holies, whose magnificence distantly reflects something of that old pre-Islamic world. Saint, poet and mystic, Al-Gailani was founder of one of the great Sufi orders. And to pause for thought here in his shrine is to feel what a dynamic force Iraqi Islam, Shia and Sunni has been through history. But now, at the end of the 20th century, however much the rich and complacent West may wish it otherwise, Islam is once again a great power in the world a beacon for the dispossessed peoples of Asia and Africa, an idea for which people still live and die. From the time of Harun al-Rashid, Baghdad was one of the three greatest cities in the world, along with Constantinople and Xi'an in China. And like them, it was one of the great transmitters by which the cultural legacy of the ancients was passed on to the medieval and modern world. It's often forgotten in the West, but much of the Greek scientific and philosophical legacy was passed on to us by Arab scholars. And here in Baghdad in particular, the Mesopotamian legacy in astronomy and mathematics is found in medieval Arab texts, like this one. The library here at the Geylani Mosque was founded in the 12th century, and some of its books date from that time, like this beautiful Quran. But it was one of the great tragedies in the history of Iraq that this period of high culture in Baghdad was cut short by the devastating Mongol attack of 1258, when the city was totally destroyed. And in the aftermath, one of the survivors left this poignant note. I recovered this book from the river Tigris, where it was thrown by the Mongols. Year of the Hijra, 656. That's 1258 in the Western calendar. I am poor for the mercy of God, Mohammed. Abdul Qad from Mecca. A testimony to enduring faith, not only in God, but in the power of the written word to create civilization.
You ask me, wrote a contemporary, about the sack of Baghdad. It was so horrible there are no words to describe it. I wish I'd died earlier and not seen how the fools destroyed these treasures of knowledge and learning. I thought I understood the world, but this holocaust is so strange and pointless that I'm struck dumb. The revolution of time and its decisions have defeated reason and knowledge. The destruction of Baghdad in 1258 and the wrecking of the irrigation canals was a turning point in the history of the Middle East. There's no doubt, said a Persian writer, that even if for a thousand years to come no evil befell Iraq, it will not be possible completely to bring back the land to the state it was before. By the end of the 16th century, Iraq, the cradle of civilization, had sunk to the lowest level. The old cities of the south were dead, the land had returned to desert. 400 years of Ottoman rule left it plundered by a greedy military. The great events of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the discovery of the New World passed it by. Up here in the north, though, the old traditions of urban life hung on. This is Mosul. The 12th century Arab traveller Ibn Jubayr describes its lovely river frontage with latticed windows and balconies. There could be no finer or more beautiful place than this, he said wistfully, to sit in the evening overlooking the river Tigris, talk to the people here who are cheerful, soft-spoken, kind and generous to strangers, fair in their dealings, civilised people. Out to the north of Mosul, in one of the loveliest spots in Iraq, the amazing religious life of the country has one more surprise. Our journey, which started in the Garden of Eden, has brought us finally to the domain of the Prince of Darkness, Satan himself. This is the Shrine of the Yazidis. On the wall of the Yazidi temple, the place of honor goes to none other than the serpent from the Garden of Eden. Once unfairly branded as devil worshippers, the Yazidis believe that the real power in the world is Satan. It's Satan who dispenses good and evil, sickness and health, and so he needs careful and regular propitiation. Keeping a weather eye on the active presence of evil in the world, in their own way the Yazidis have come to terms with the devil's bargain of Iraqi history. After all its great achievements, Iraq reached the modern age like a society stopped in time. Right up until the 1920s, its ancient towns looked no different from those of the third millennium BC, save that the ancients built bigger and better and had a higher standard of living. Oil would change all that, the second largest reserves in the world. And with independence, Iraq once again became a name on the world stage. Huge monuments were erected to its victorious wars. Here was a militarized society using cruelty as an arm of state a state centered on a ruler cult which would have done credit to the ancient kings of Assyria. 
heaping up thousands of battered helmets taken from Iranian dead in emulation of Sennacherib and Ashur Nasipal, who set up pillars of skulls outside their gates, blinding our enemies with the terror-inspiring glamour of our rule. And in an eerie reenactment of past horrors, Saddam would represent himself as an all-conquering Assyrian king riding roughshod over his foes. It was the old equation of Iraqi history, the idea that only a brutal ruler could hold the land together, stop it being plundered by its neighbors, a ruler who dealt in terror and savage and merciless punishment. There had been many such rulers in Iraq's past, like the king who had himself represented on his public monuments, serenaded in a pleasure garden while his enemy's severed head hung in a tree. The final step of this new order was to restore the most potent symbol of that ancient past, Babylon itself. Babylon the Great, as the Book of Revelation calls it, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Even during the height of the war with Iran, this colossal project went ahead, rearing up palace walls with armies of guest workers from Egypt and Sudan, where Jewish captives had labored on the original. And in the rebuilt palace, every 50th brick was stamped in Arabic, restored in the era of Saddam. Just as in 600 BC, Nebuchadnezzar had advertised his own Babylonian revival for posterity. The message to the world from the late 20th century rulers of Iraq was simple. Mesopotamia, they said, had emerged once again from the darkness to become a bright light of civilization. But civilization consists not in walls of brick and stone, but in the ideals created within them, in the humane goals of life pursued by the predecessors who attempted to moderate naked power, as the Sumerians said, to cause justice to prevail in the land, that the strong may not oppress the weak. On the eve of the Gulf War of 1991, I returned to the marshes of southern Iraq. They'd been ravaged and then drained in the aftermath of the war with Iran. The water level had sunk, the waving green reed beds were now shriveled and brown. Once upon a time, said an ancient poet, Sumer, the great land of divine laws, had all that was needed for life. You, Sumer, set the ideals of civilization upon humankind. Lofty ideals, robed in enduring light. Once upon a time, when there was no fear, no terror. In 1991, a new war was fought in this desert where the first civilization arose, close to the ruins of the first city, Uruk. Another war fought over the natural resources of the earth on which we all depend. Another war supposedly for civilization against barbarism. It is as if history has come not to its end, but back to its starting point. Viewed from across the plain today, Uruk, the first city of the world, the city of Genesis, seems like a great source of energy whose power is exhausted. The wheel of history has turned full circle here, back to the conditions which held in the beginning, before the Sumerians patiently labored to turn this monochrome landscape into emerald green fields stretching as far as the eye can see before they sailed their gaily festooned boats up the old track of the Euphrates from Nippur to rejoice in the spring festivals of the great goddess. 
As they saw it themselves, this was a heroic age, the age of Gilgamesh and the first city builders. And we city dwellers of the late 20th century in London and New York, Paris and Tokyo, can take a vicarious pride in their achievement. But it is this desert landscape of Uruk which is the spectre facing the children of the 21st century.